So I had this happen to me when I was eight or nine, but I'll always remember it like it was yesterday. I was sleeping in bed and woke up to not being alone. But here's the thing. I would always sleep with my door shut and the covers over my face. Also, no else in the room. But when I woke up, I felt that sensation of not being alone, right? Eight or nine year old me laid there for a few minutes, but it never went away. Curiosity got the best of me. And to this day, I really wish I didn't pull the covers away from my face. And I really wish I hadn't there in front of me, above me and my bed with this white mask, like an opera mask with no facial features, just eyes, not like eyes you can see, but like the eyes of the mask, just pitch black. If you ever had the feeling that you can't do anything scared, like no moving, screaming or crying, that kind of fear, then you know how I felt. I laid there for what felt like minutes, staring at this thing, this face mask, whatever, till I got back my senses, covered my face and again laid there in shock. Like I already wasn't, but after a few minutes, past the sense of calmness, I felt like whatever it was left and again, but this time I sat up and looked around my room for it to be gone. At this given moment, I was chilled. There was another time I saw it was when I was a lot older in high school and I would go spend the night at friends places. This weekend I spent a few days at a friend's place and when I was done and got home, I was carrying my stuff back to my room. So my hallway is like this. There's a main hall, then a hall attached to the main, my hallway. So you would have to turn the corner to go down my hall and there like the face again in front of me, I jumped back to look at my parents and look back for it to be gone in seconds. I'll never forget what I saw and I think I never will. When I was a baby, my mum was taking a nap whilst I slept in my cot. She was half asleep when she saw a man walk into the room, take his cap off and place it on the nightstand. Thinking it was my dad, she asked, you're home from work early? He never replied. When she opened her eyes, no one was there and no cap was on the nightstand. When I was around five or six years old, I walked downstairs early in the morning before anyone was awake to get myself something to drink. Our old kitchen was a horrible orange color with these horrible sheer orange curtains that you could see through. When I walked into the kitchen, I saw a man slash boy sitting on the windowsill, knees up to his chest. I could see him through the curtains, but not clear enough to see much detail. I remember running back up the stairs as fast as I could, jumping on top of my sleeping sister my mum and sister always remind me of that story and are shocked when I tell them I remember it vividly. My sister also reported that she used to hear one of the dining room table chairs scraping along the floor most nights when we were all upstairs in bed. When I was around eight, we moved to a new house. A few things happened to me there. The bathroom tap was one of those old generic taps that you have to twist to turn on. One day, I remember suddenly realizing that I could hear gushing water coming from the bathroom next to my bedroom. When I investigated, I found the bathroom twip twisted all the way on to the point where it took me a good 20 seconds to turn it off completely. I didn't see anyone go into that bathroom. I also had a recurring nightmare when I lived in that house, which I would dream about once every month or so. I only found this out recently but my mother and sister both reported seeing a dark shadow moving across the wall on the upstairs hallway towards my bedroom and disappearing once it reached my open doorway. They reported seeing this separately on multiple occasions. One night in that house, when I was around 10 years old, I had come back from a bike ride with my father around autumn time. A car had driven through a puddle and absolutely soaked the both of us. My dad went into the kitchen to make himself a cup of coffee whilst I sat on the sofa to watch TV. I suddenly felt a chunk of my wet hair drop onto my shoulder as if it had been picked up in the air. When I looked at it, I saw the chunk was slowly unraveling as if it had been picked up and twisted around someone's finger. 
Months later, I told my mom the story, to which she freaked out and told me how her father, who had died of cancer around a month before the incident, used to sneak up behind her and twist her hair as a child to make a jump. We moved to my current home when I was around 12. A lot of stuff went on in that house and I always felt a heavy presence. We had laminated flooring in our living room and one night whilst my parents were out shopping, I heard something being dragged slowly across the floor. I figured it must have been my cat pouring at a plug that was lying on the floor. We had a floor lamp which was almost always unplugged. I thought this up until my parents came home. When my mother opened the door, I heard her say, come on then, in you come. She was speaking to my cat, who had been outside the entire time they were out. I've had my feet scratched whilst I've been trying to sleep. I've heard loud, heavy footsteps walk through the kitchen in the middle of the day, thinking my dad had come home from work early. I've heard my mother call my name, or cough, or sigh, when she hasn't been home. I've seen black shapes moving towards me from the corner of my eye. I'm not sure if these incidents are unrelated or if I'm being followed by something specific. My mum is a believer in the spiritual practices and she decided to practice smudging and saging, the burning of a stick of sage to cleanse negative energy and invite positive energy. I wouldn't class myself as a Wiccan slash pagan, but I definitely believe the practices to an extent. Ever since my mother saged the house, the experiences have stopped and I no longer feel a dark presence. I still have the odd experience every now and again, but I no longer feel haunted. I hope whatever may have been connected to me is gone for good. When I was a teenager, me and two friends were helping my mom bring in the groceries. It was dusk in late summer and the sky was getting dark. Out of thin air, a massive black dog appeared. It was the size of a very, very large wolf. But it wasn't a wolf, as it was clearly a black dog of some sort. It looked very much like the Grimm from Harry Potter. It's the closest thing I can describe it. We all froze and stared at it. It happened super fast. It was just standing there in between us and the car looking at us. What made it a supernatural event was that the dog was a holograph, or at least it appeared that way. The outline of its body seemed to glow and shift, almost like a computer glitch. Its eyes also seemed to glow with a yellow light from within. Then it ran straight into the side of the house and disappeared into thin air. Me and my friends all looked at each other like, did you see that? Obviously, the black dog is an omen and is popular in European folklore. I'm in the US. But does anyone have any other insight on the great black dog? Anyone else seen it or know what it means for it to appear? My mentor is an old time medicine man who's practiced for over 60 years. Nobody would think anything of him, except he's old and odd. He doesn't care what people think about him. I met a co-worker who had a brother and son who killed themselves a few days apart. A niece tried to hang herself in his garage two years ago. She died later driving drunk into a tree. This guy was afraid of losing more family. Nobody on his res could help. He happened to mention it to me and I told my mentor. We went to my co-worker's house to look around. We said we'd come back that night when the evil ones were out. When my mentor prepares, he fasts, prays to creator and all good in the universe. He doesn't talk much and gives thanks to all those who will stand with us against evil. It's like he becomes a different person. I do whatever he asks. It's my job. He told me to rust up, pray out all fear because we were going to face something very bad and powerful. We don't take much with us when we go. Mentor said this evil was too strong for sage or tobacco. It was demonic from the death world. We went to the guy's house that night. Mentor told me to watch over the family. He went out into a field alone. It was pitch dark and he was gone for what seemed like hours. I waited and started to worry. Finally, he came back and said, 
Tomorrow night, we'll wait down the road. We spent the day praying hard, fasting and preparing. Medicine people have to see two worlds. We who help them must understand there's other realms. It was almost midnight when we left. We walked up and down off the road, surpassing cars couldn't see us. Mentor motioned me to stay behind him. We hid down in a ditch and waited for something to happen. I had the feeling Mentor knew what he was looking for, but I had no clue. Several cars went by, then it got really quiet. All I remember is seeing dim lights coming to our left. Mentor leaped out of the ditch and stood by the road. I stood behind him. He walked out on the road and stopped. The lights got closer. It was a big, black, old car like a Cadillac or Lincoln Continental. It wasn't a limo. What I noticed is that it didn't have any doors and the motor didn't sound like a regular car. I'm a mechanic on the side and know about cars. I've heard a lot about motors. This didn't sound like a real mechanical motor. What Mentor did next scared and fascinated me. The car stopped and dust started kicking up around it like it was trying to hide itself. Mentor walked around to the passenger side. There was no glass in the windows or windshields. The car was running, but I couldn't smell gas fumes, oil or exhaust. Something about it smelled like death. Mentor was praying low and seemed to go into a trance. He looked inside. I peeked over his right shoulder. I swear, if it weren't for prayers, I'd have fainted. I saw a clown sitting on the driver's side. It had messy, orange, afro-like hair, white face, mean smile like the Joker's and dirty, ragged ruffles around its neck. I can't call it a man. I don't know what it was, but it was evil. I couldn't look at it very long. It had hypnotic power. I didn't want it to see me. It took all I had to break from it. The mentor was very closer to me. He didn't look at it. He just reached inside to the back seat. There were people sitting back there making the most awful whimpers I ever heard. I couldn't see their faces, but knew they were dead spirits. My whole head felt like it was plugged up. I couldn't hear, smell, or blink my eyes. It felt like I was floating and couldn't feel my feet. I just watched Mentor. He reached in, pulled out something with his right hand, waved his left hand over the passengers and prayed. I saw with my own eyes the passengers float out the back windshield, up toward the stars, and were gone. Mentor pulled out a roll of rope with a noose tied to the end of it. He showed me my throat felt tight like I was strangling. That clown began to laugh the most wicked cackle I ever heard. My throat began burning and I couldn't breathe. I fell to my knees, choking. Mentor put his hand on my shoulder and was praying for me. He handed me a Bible and a small cloth that I held to my stomach. It felt like I was going to vomit. My mouth was tingling. I started strangling, which broke into a cough. Then my lungs filled with air and I started feeling better. The numbness left my head and body. I stood up and patted Mentor's arm. The clown's laughing turned into a horrible scream. We turned around and that car was smoking like it was on fire. Bad smells were coming out of the smoke like stale alcohol, blood, burning flesh, singed hair and cigarettes. Mentor was right. It took all the strength we had and more to deal with this. My throat felt cold, then warmth came into my body as the scream faded. The car was gone. We were standing by the road as the sun was starting to rise. Mentor sang an old song as we walked back toward the guy's house. I just sat on the couch while Mentor told the guy what his relatives took. The guy said a lot of his family members died over the years in car wrecks, suicides, cancer, kidney disease and alcoholism. He told the guy to move away and live well. Then we left. I must have slept for two days. I was exhausted. When I finally woke up, I was really hungry and forgot I hadn't eaten for three days at least. Mentor told me I did well and headed home. We still work together and don't take money for our help. Mentor says the way to pay us is by doing right and living the good ways. Nobody in that guy's family died tragically again. 
I shared our story with mentor's permission. He said it was all right. People need to know about the dead, find out too late. Anyways, we live in a community and at the end of my road, there's a house that a family used to live in. The matriarch of the family passed away and her grandsons and middle-aged kids are all morons. They hunt and take more than what they need. Rumors of sexual abuse, and they're just plain jealous, mean people. After the old lady died, my uncle Russell and his wife Cecilia moved in. Things were good, and they started hearing things. They heard a growl in the backyard, something big banging against the old cars in the back. Feelings of being watched, and there's an old empty house beside the newer one they live in. They can't get themselves to go into that house. They said that they just get a weird, awful vibe from there. Well, this morning, Cecilia was outside and something came walking into their yard. It was about four or five feet tall and walked on two legs. It had long, black, scruffy hair and smelt like a skunk. It growled at her and she went running inside. They have three dogs and two of them came running inside with their tail tucked between their legs. But the tiniest one went after it and grabbed that dog and tore it all to hell and took it to the bush. My uncle went after it with a rifle and couldn't find blood or a trail or anything. He came back and went to my grandparents' place and told my grandfather what happened. And when they got there, that little dog was back. They said it hurt badly and it was what looks like razor blade cuts all over it. My uncle said the wounds are like it was after the dog's wiener. He never saw animal wounds like that before and we all avid outdoorsmen. My family is speculating that we think it's Indian medicine. It's like a kind of voodoo that bad people practice. They use it to gamble or to hurt people. But it's also good that it does too if the people that practice it are good. For example, we went to a sweat lodge because we had thought that someone put bad medicine on my dad. But that's another story. But while we're in this sweat, it's pitch black and they pour water on these hot rocks that make it steam inside. And you're supposedly supposed to go to the spirit world. While we were in there, this old man's voice spoke up and wanted to talk to me, which was odd. So we sat there and this voice told me my language that I don't speak and someone translated that my late girlfriend was outside and she wanted to tell me that she loved me and believed in me. No one in that sweat knew anything about me. So that's just a little background on some of our culture. But now I'm at home I'm going to bless my home and clean my rifle and my grandfather and I are going to go out back of that place to some old trails and leave moose bones from our last kill there with some trail cams set up. So hopefully we catch a pick of it, which I highly doubt. My family is not very religious, but my family believes in God. I went to church a lot while growing up, but I'm more towards the agnostic side now. However, several of my family members have claimed to see spirits, including my mom, cousin, and grandma. One of my aunts is apparently able to see them very well, but it terrifies her so she doesn't talk about it. And last but certainly not least, I'm no stranger to death. When I was seven, my dad passed away from lung cancer, and then one of my other uncles, not the one in the title, passed away in a motorcycle accident roughly seven months after. In 2018, I went to see the Avengers Infinity War, the first Friday it showed with my mom and my best friend's mom, who's a family friend. After we watched it, I cried, huge Spider-Man fan. We went out to dinner and we got to discussing my aunt and uncle who were living in DC. We talked about how my uncle hadn't looked very good the last time we'd seen him in March and how he had surgery that day. I specifically remember saying, I don't know. I don't have a good feeling about it. He really doesn't seem well. I don't have a good feeling about what's happening with him. I'm not sure he's going to make it. We had no idea, but my uncle had very aggressive lung cancer. He and my aunts hadn't told any of the family yet. The very next day, my mom and I were doing yard work when my aunts called. 
I answered it and said hello. And my aunt, in a horribly calm and detached voice, said, I need to talk to your mother. I went and handed the phone to my mom, who rolled her eyes because she didn't want to be on the phone and watched. I had a sinking feeling in my guts already, and my mom confirmed it with a loud, son of a bitch. My uncle had died in the night, and my aunt had found his body the next morning. I'll spare you all the details, but it wasn't a gentle passing, though it wasn't caused by the surgery he had. My mom and my other aunts immediately flew up to DC the next day to make sure my aunts wouldn't do anything drastic since she lived in a penthouse apartment at the top of a very tall building. My mom told me later that she had to clean up the bathroom where he died and it was very traumatic for her. Obviously, I had no way of knowing that he was that ill but it was never set right with me that I hit the nail on the head so clearly and less than 12 hours before. It's bothered me for two years now, since he passed in 2018. Truth be told, my mom was the one who had pointed out to me before how he hadn't been looking good, and once she did, I couldn't stop seeing it. We have a summer cottage in Tennessee that both my mom and cousin have claimed they've seen a spirit in. Both say they've seen a woman in an old style dress. My cousin said Victorian, but I'm not sure how well she knows each era's clothing style. So I'm not 100% sure on that, within the house. My cousin told me she didn't seem malicious, and more that she was warning us of something. I've never seen this spirit, and it hasn't popped up in a few years. But once when I was in this house completely alone, I heard footsteps. Then an hour later, I heard the sound of breathing next to me. I knew it wasn't the AC, because it turns on very loudly, and this was just breathing. After that incident, my mom and cousin didn't see the spirits anymore. I've always been more skeptical, but I always remember these occasions and others. One night, something huge crashed into the wall of my bedroom and woke me up. I knew I hadn't imagined it because my dog woke up and started barking like crazy, which terrified me because my window was open and I didn't want anything breaking in. I grabbed him and held him until he settled down. The next morning, there was no tree branch or animal footprints in the dirt. My house looked completely normal, and I know it was probably an animal, but the crash was huge. It made my bed shake, and there was no evidence that anything had ever happened. Suffice to say, I don't sleep with my windows open anymore. One time, I dreamt about my dad while I was sleeping. He was exactly the same as he had been while he was alive, and he was telling me that he had been taking care of Cliffy, our old dog who had passed before my dad did. My family told me it was him visiting me, but I haven't ever really dreamed about him since. I've gotten strong emotions and feelings about him, and my mom says he talks to her sometimes during emergencies. She told me that when Hurricane Irma was approaching Florida, he told her to leave, and so she packed us up and we fled the state. Irma hit just south of us, and flooded our yard and barn and my car which we had left behind. We'd been debating whether to leave or not before that because my grandma lives with us and traveling is hard on her, so we tried not to do it unnecessarily. Our property was without power for over a week in hot, humid September, but we were safe in Tennessee. I think I'm rambling at this point, but I wanted to share and see what you all think. Again, I am more skeptical, but I'm beginning to wonder about things. With Halloween approaching, my family and I were having a little Halloween party, and stories were getting shared. Anyway, a story came up from my childhood that brought up a lot of repressed memories of something we've never been able to explain. I got the urge to share. Maybe someone will have more insight. We're from Utah, and when I was five or six years old, we took a road trip in a rented camper we got to California. There's this specific area around Nephi, Utah, that had some kind of massacre in the mid-1900s. All I know is that some kind of mass murder occurred out there and all of the bodies were buried in the desert area off of I-15 in a mass grave. Needless to say, it's an eerie part of Utah and that main highway travels. Anyway, we were on our way back. I was sitting in the front seat next to my mother. My dad was driving. 
We were coming through Nephi, Utah, near the massacre area. All of a sudden, my dad, my dad starts to get a little panicked and tells my mom to lean over and look into his side view mirror. I did as well. What we saw was the back of the trailer door was flapping open and shut in the wrong direction. To give a visual, the back of the trailer was a single door that opened from the right side and the door hinges were on the left. The door was swinging back and forth off of the hinges. The most impossible way. Freaked out, my dad pulls the trailer over, thinking something was broken. We get out of the trailer off the side of I-15. It's late evening. The sun is starting to go down and there were no cars around. We go through the door and look at it. The hinges were latched in perfect condition. We were completely baffled. We knew what we saw and it made zero sense compared to what we were staring at now. No signs that it was even capable of doing that and no defects. We stood there for about 15 minutes, rechecking everything. All of a sudden, this green Oldsmobile car pulls up probably 100 yards behind us. We originally thought someone was stopping to see if we needed any help. These three massive Polynesian guys get out of the car. They just stood there for a sec, staring at us. Then they walked to the back of their car, looking at their trunk as if something was wrong with their car as well. All I remember is that I had the most terrified feeling arise in my body. I was scared. I looked at my parents just to see what they were going to do with the situation. I saw the same look on both of my parents' faces. Fear. Something didn't feel right about this situation and my parents felt it too. My mom whispers for me to get back in the trailer. I ran in there so fast, she wasn't going to tell me twice. I was watching out the window as my dad was trying to hurriedly get everything secured back up. The three guys noticed my parents trying to get back to the trailer and all three start, what I remember and thought of it as, marching quickly towards our trailer. My parents ran into the trailer, started it up, and my dad gunned it out of there before the guys could get to the trailer. It was pretty creepy, and I always wondered what would have happened if we hadn't gotten out of there. I've always thought something bad would have happened. Flashback to my freshman year at med school. I chose a very niche, we were in five students at most, psychology class at my elective course. And we were right away informed that the professor who used to teach those classes had suddenly fell ill and wouldn't be able to be there on the first few weeks, but would return as soon as her health improved. I'd never heard of it before, so I wasn't really that disturbed. Kept on living my freshman life, and that includes campus parties. In one of them, a couple of months later, I met a journalism major, found out he was friendly with a very close childhood friend of mine, and we exchanged numbers. We ended up never really seeing each other after that day, but we chatted for a few weeks, and we eventually got to the tell me about your family talk. He then tells me his mom was a professor at the psychology department, but wasn't teaching at the moment due to recently diagnosed cancer. Yes, she was the professor that was supposed to teach the course I was taking. A sad coincidence that made the following psych classes a lot more gloomy. A few months later, at the end of my freshman year, I'd already lost touch with the journalist by then, I had something completely out of my routine to do on the other side of town. And keep in mind, this all happened in the biggest city in the country, on a Saturday morning and took the bus home. Eventually, an old man got in and sat by my side. I had a fiction book by one of my favourite authors with me, and the old man said he chose that seat because that was his daughter's favourite book. He said he was feeling a bit lost because she was terribly ill, and the sight of that book made him think of how she was before she got sick. He then told me he always thought he'd be the one that had cancer, as he worked with chemicals at factories in a time when people didn't really care about work safety. I asked him when he worked there, because my late grandpa was also a chemist at the same factory. And it turns out, they were actually co-workers for some time. As the elderly usually do, he got excited by the back in the old days talk and started telling me more about his career and his family. When I told him which college I went to, he asked me if by any chance I knew his daughter, a psychology professor there, and told me her name. Yes, 
there she was again. A few days later, I got the formal email that she'd passed away. And it felt so weird that her life and mine had so many intersections. I flirted with a son who's my childhood friend's friend. I met a father in a completely random scenario because I was unknowingly reading her favourite book and found out he had been my grandfather's work colleague 40 years before. I chose her class to take as an elective, a small and niche course with five students per year. All of this happening in a city with 12.8 million inhabitants. And I never got to meet her. It feels like I've barely missed the opportunity of meeting someone I had at least three different life paths that would lead us to meet. Do y'all believe in coincidences? The first one would be in our house in Australia. The house was fairly old, but not crazy old. All the activity would happen in one room. My sister, when she was really young, walked into my parents' room late at night to ask my parents where the old lady was talking to her. My mum apparently freaked out because they claimed to have seen an old lady walk around the door to the room. Fast forward 10 years and I trade rooms with my sister to that room with the lady sightings. At the time, I didn't know about this ghost lady because my parents didn't want to scare me. Every other night, my radio would turn on to a specific station. Can't remember now. At a really high volume, about 1am 1, 1 to 3am. It would always scare me because it was so loud and woke me up. There were times I got up to turn it off and it would turn back on. My parents took it off me because it would still turn on even when unplugged to the same radio station. At the time, I was a naive 10 year old so my parents didn't tell me about the lady until I was older. It all makes sense since all the sightings and radio drama was only in that one room. To add, none of my family is religious or anything involving believing, but when it happens firsthand, it's hard to deny. When we moved to New Zealand, where I experienced another, I was sitting there watching TV when I saw a teenage looking girl outside walking between slash behind two bushes. I remember it clearly that the body slash dress was white and the hair was long and black. I know, stereotypical movie look, but I remember vividly. It didn't seem to walk across the bushes, but almost float, as in no head bobbing associated with walking. I couldn't see the legs because they were behind the bush. I ran outside excited, thinking my sister was home. Nobody was there. I go inside to find my sister doesn't come home until two more hours. It was 3 p.m. We live rural, sort of on a farm. Nobody was walking on our property especially from the direction it came from, where there's a fence with a drop off to the road. You can only get on the front lawn from the opposite direction. About seven years later, I heard my dad talking to my mum about a girl he saw when we first moved here to the same exact description, in a spot five metres from where I saw her. We both haven't seen her since. Spooky. He couldn't believe it when I said I saw something the same at about the same time that many years back. Lastly, I'm part Maori. In Maori beliefs, a fantail, New Zealand native bird, will fly into a house building and will signify bad luck or death. It's happened to me about five times or when I'm alone. Every time a family member has passed away within a week. Five times isn't a coincidence at this point. Must be my Maori ancestors trying to tell death is on the way. I'm not religious. I'm not a believer of stuff, nor a denier. I just go with the flow and let things show themselves before I make up my mind about what's real and what's not. But it's hard to deny things with the experience I've had at this point. Thought I should share. I don't talk about it in person. People think you're crazy. Hope you enjoy my stories. They'll stay with me forever, probably. I would also like to add, I have a green stone necklace, Maori thing, that was blessed by my papa. I hadn't worn it for a few years, and before bed one time I had this feeling, an urge to wear it like it caught the corner of my eye. I wore it to bed, and that night, in my mum's dream, she got a visit from her grandfather, my papa's dad. He told my mum everything will be alright. Within a year, my papa, my mum's dad, died of cancer. 
Also, when my mum and her sister were walking with my popper to get their green stone blessed, they both looked at each other and were shocked to find they could both feel the necklace in their hands, beating like a heart. Both at the same time, and similar if not the same beat. I was walking with them. It was weird. One night, my sweet mate Brian and I were getting ready for a thirsty Thursday, or something of the sort when it happened. We were close friends and shared a suite with a Vietnamese couple that we barely knew, Hazel and Richie. That being said, we're in front of the double vanity mirror that's located outside and to the left of the bathroom, which has a toilet and a tub in it, no sink. When Brian decides to head into the bathroom, at that point, we were playing music as we were getting ready. I heard the door slam and Brian yelled out, oh my God, I'm so sorry, as he runs back to the vanity with his hands over his mouth. He whispers, I almost just walked in on Hazel, dude. She was like, no, and slammed the door back on me. He was obviously embarrassed at the awkwardness, especially because Hazel and Richie were quiet, polite and private people. I jokingly teased, damn, don't you fucking knock, dude. Anyway, I was done before him, so I told him I would head downstairs to the lobby and wait up for our other friends, who were supposed to be coming down to meet us too. After a few minutes of people watching students' badges into the dorm, my jaw suddenly flooded. I fucking see Hazel and Richie walking into the building, holding a shit ton of ShopRite bags. I instantly got that shit out your heart feeling that you get on a steep roller coaster drop. As they get into the elevator and it closes up, the one next to it dings open and I can see Brian standing there. I can tell by his face that he immediately notices something's wrong. As fast as I can possibly get words out of my mouth, I say, dude, Hazel and Richie just fucking walked by. Now he's seriously confused and says, what are you talking about? Hazel just freaked out on me, remember? I tried to keep my shit together and told him that couldn't have been Hazel because I just saw her and Richie walk in. His eyes widened and turned around to viciously start pressing the elevator button. We rush upstairs and crash into the room like a SWAT team. Hazel and Richie are in the kitchen unpacking their groceries and the bathroom door is wide open, lights off and no hissing of a toilet that had recently been flushed. We inspected the bathroom but there was nothing there, no sign of anyone having just been in it. Brian and I are fucking shook at this point. He runs into the kitchen freaking on Hazel, asking if he just walked in on her in the bathroom like 10 minutes ago. She gives him a confused look and motions to their groceries, pointing out they just got here right before we did. After some research, we figured out that we may have been dealing with a gin entity, which have been said to sometimes inhabit bathrooms. A little bit of backstory here. This was the final straw in a string of events that led us to believe that this room was seriously haunted. From human-like knocking and noises in the walls to random baby cooing, amongst other things. We already had our suspicions about not being alone in this apartment. Also, one of my friends was an RA, warned me about that apartment as he lived there two years before I did and experienced some seriously spooky shit too. He knew I was living there because of a video I posted on my Facebook at the time that hosted noises coming from my room that were creeping me out. My family and I lived in town until about the time I was 10 or 11. My parents found a larger house on 10 acres of land, about 20 minutes out of town, that they jumped at the chance to own so we packed up and moved out. The house was built into a hill, so that from the front of the house it was two stories high, but from the other side it was three, including the semi-finished basement and a deck to the second story. The land was rolling grass hills. A small stream ran down the middle of the property and fed into a medium-sized creek at the bottom border of the land. Soon after moving in, my sister, eight to nine years old, and I, started experiencing an uneasiness about the place. Note, we never really talked about this until later on in life, 
about college age, but we were both experiencing the same uneasy feeling, did the same behavior when home alone, etc. The kitchen was open into a step down den, which we used as the living room. And on the other side of the kitchen was an open door frame into the dining room. Whenever she or I were home alone at night, we would never be anywhere else in the house, except in the den, sitting in a reclining love seat chair, looking towards the TV, the opposite direction of the kitchen. We'd shut all the pull down blinds on the glass doors out to the deck in the kitchen as if we didn't want to see something in the reflection. And for absolutely no reason, we never looked towards the door frame behind the kitchen. I would feel this sense of impending doom, like someone was staring right at the back of my head from that doorway almost every single time I was home alone past sundown. I also had a very overweight orange tabby cat at the time, named Tiger. This cat was cool, just gave zero fucks and mostly laid around and fought on the couch I would make out of throw pillows for him. On more than one occasion when I was home alone at night, in the living room watching TV, he would be laying on the couch, carpet etc in the living room with me. I'd get a surge of uneasiness, more than the usual amount, and break out in a cold sweat, unmoving due to fear. Tiger would all of a sudden snap awake and stare straight at the doorframe behind the kitchen. His hair would puff up like cats do when they fight or whatnot, and this cat would sprint out of the room to the basement or behind the couch. And believe me, sprinting was super unusual behavior for him. We would hear footsteps walking down the hallway upstairs, often pausing and then continuing, almost as if they were listening. I would try to sneak quietly to the front part of the house in order to look up the open staircase to the hallway upstairs to see what was making the sounds. And every time I did this, the steps would stop as if they knew what I was trying to do and would soon resume once I was out of eyesight. I loved playing outside and during the days would wander down the wooded creek at the bottom of the property and catch crawdads, build dams, etc. As soon as the sun would begin to set, the sense of doom would return. I'd sprint up the long hill back to the house because in my mind, I knew. I just had this feeling that I could not be caught outside when the sun went down. As I would sprint back to the garage to go inside, I'd experience the same feeling that I would get from the door frame behind the kitchen. But outside, it would be coming from behind me in the wood line. I never would look back as I ran. I couldn't force myself to do it. I'd place things down, such as my flip phone or iPod, a pen I was using, etc. Walk away to do something else and would find that item not where I swear I just placed it. I had a little ADHD, so I would chuck this up to that, look all over for the thing, and then eventually find it in the place I swore I left it. It made me question my own sanity a little bit, to be honest. After a certain point of these happenings, I'd lose something and would just yell, give it back, I guess out of desperation or annoyance, and soon after I would always find the item again. I have no idea. Additionally, soon after we moved into this house, I began to sleepwalk. My mother would often catch me coming down the stairs from my bedroom and would redirect me back to bed after I woke up and would come to. I never would remember sleepwalking, but would remember her waking me up on the stairs or sometimes in the kitchen and her taking me back to bed. Where it gets weird are the times she didn't catch me or was already asleep. Again, I never remembered the actual sleepwalking, but on multiple occasions when she didn't catch me, I would come to the half-finished basement. When I would wake up, it wasn't a groggy, coming out of sleep kind of waking. My eyes would snap open and I would be wide awake. I'd be standing, my nose about one inch in front of the closed door to this utility room underneath the stairs, just standing there every single time. This is where I would snap awake, fight or flight response instantly kicking in, and I would sprint, crying and yelling, up the basement steps, up the normal steps, and fly into my parents' room totally freaked out. They would eventually calm me down and let me sleep in there for the rest of the night. Now this leads me to my actual bedroom. It was shaped like a capital L and was arranged in a way that at the top of the L was my closet. And at the other end of this L was my bed right next to the door. 
so that when I was lying in bed, I didn't have direct line of sight with the closet. Hopefully that makes sense. The closet door was one that had four panels, and when you pulled it open, the panels accordioned out in each side. We had new carpet put in shortly after moving in, so the closet door would slide audibly along the carpet when you opened it. It's important to note that under no circumstances would I ever leave the closet doors open, especially before bed. I was terrified of leaving them open. At night, I would lay in my bed, always curled up in a ball, with my face under the covers. It was very important to me to not have anything else of the covers for any reason. I'd be lying there slightly uneasy and begging for sleep to just take me when I would hear the closet doors start to open. I would hear the sound of them sliding slowly along the carpet. I would hold my breath and try not to make any sound. The sliding would go in a pattern as if listening to see if I was awake. This happened multiple, multiple times. I'd freak the holy fuck out and fast as lightning would fly out of bed, open my door and run down the hall screaming to my parents. This happened so often, I started trying to wait longer and longer before I ran, as long as I could possibly keep my cool for, and one night, I decided this is the night I figure out what's happening. I waited under the covers, drenched in nervous sweat, waiting for the sliding to start. After a while, it did. Slowly, as if listening, I heard the scrape of the wood along the carpet, then it would pause. After a little while, it started again. Then another pause. I'm silently crying at this point, hand clasped over my open mouth, praying I wasn't making any sound. The third time it started, the sliding sound again, and I heard the creak the doors made as they would when I would open them about the halfway mark. The sound of the squeak put me over the edge. I couldn't do it. I flung out of bed scrambled to get the door open, screaming with sheer terror, and ran to my parents' room down the hall for probably the hundredth time since moving in. My mom was irritated, since this was such a regular occurrence, and took me back to my room to show me nothing is happening. She flips the lights on and shows me into my room. The closet doors were wide open. I panic. My mom blames it on me for forgetting to close them, but let me tell you, that would never have been the case. There's no way wind would have opened them because those doors were of good weight and were right across the carpet. At some point, there was this barn cat that started hanging around our deck and would always follow me around the yard when I was out. We fed it a bit and it spent time between our house and the neighbours, the neighbours being like a quarter mile up the road. I liked the cat and liked that I didn't have to be alone in the backyard. The cat, however, wouldn't follow me down to the creek. It would always stop at the same point on the way down the hill and just refuse to come further. One day, with much coaxing, I finally got the cat to come to the creek with me, but it was pretty apprehensive about it. The next day, I went outside to play and saw buzzards circling. My heart dropped. I went to look, and it was the cat. Now we had coyotes out there, so I thought that's what got the cat. When I got to where it was, though, it hadn't been eaten. Its entire back half was skinned. I've never seen any coyote do that to something before, and it made me doubt that's what happened. I only looked for a second or two, then ran home crying. Still to this day, I feel so guilty about that cat dying. I feel like if I hadn't let it think it was okay to go to the creek, it wouldn't have done it on its own. I don't know. I had a medium-sized dog, Molly, who was a wild card. If she got loose... You'd be on the hunt forever in the car for her. She loved to be outside, and we had one of those dog leads where the middle screws into the yard that we would let her out the front door onto. Getting her to come inside was always a challenge. You would have to go out to the middle of the tie-out and essentially reel her in like a fish, because when she saw you coming to get her, she would run the opposite side, rain or snow. I was home alone one evening. Per usual, I was in the living room, not looking towards the doorway. Molly was outside and had been for about 30 minutes, which is usually how long we would leave her. It was dusk outside. The sun was down, but it was still bright enough outside to see pretty far. I opened the front door, and Molly was right there by the door, which struck me as odd. 
Normally she would take off to the other end. Then I noticed not only was she on the close end of her la leash, she was leaning into her collar as if she was straining to come inside. I walked the 10 or so steps down the walkway to her, grabbed her collar in order to unhook her, and then I saw this thing. There was a downhill slope in from the front yard, and there were two apple trees about halfway between the hill and the road. Right between those two trees, almost in the complete shadows, was where I saw it. Now, I've seen coyotes, and the only way to rationalize this in my mind was that it was some kind of sick coyote. It was the shape of a dog with an emaciated looking body, and I swear it didn't have fur or even skin. It looked like I was seeing its muscles on the outside. It appeared to not have a bottom jaw, and I swear it seemed as if its head was upside down. The pointy ears were pointed towards the ground. Like honestly, I have no idea what I was looking at. My brain almost didn't register it or something. I only looked at it for about 10 seconds. Molly's unhooked colour in one hand and the lead in the other. A sense of panic and doom overtook me. I promptly let go of her collar and managed to quietly get out the word, run. She bolted straight into the house and so did I. I still can't figure out what I was looking at and I'm not sure if I want to. My parents eventually moved to Florida for my dad's job right before my senior year of high school. I stayed with my grandma to finish out my last year with friends. I've never been back to the house and once I moved out, I haven't sleepwalked since. It all began when I was a child. My childhood wasn't very great in the beginning because my father was, and probably is, a total monster and asshole. He was often drunk and beat my mother. Finally, she decided to run away from him. She took me with her because she didn't want to leave me with him alone. We packed our stuff when he was at work and ran from that place. We fled to my grandma and my aunt. They lived in a village far away from our old home. But there we were safe. It was the first time I met them and I quickly fell in love with both of them. They were really nice and cool people. A bit weird at first sight because of their hobbies. They were interested in occultism, magic and witchcraft. Even the house they lived in looks magical. It was old and beautiful, but at night it could be scary. But soon I began to feel very comfortable in the house. My mother on the other hand didn't like it. She was still afraid that my father could find us and she hated that occult stuff, although she grew up with it. My family was not usual. My grandma told me stories that her ancestors were magicians and witches. My grandpa, who I've never met because he died a long time before my birth, was a demonologist who did research and paranormal stuff. It sounded wild and straight up out of a fantasy book, but I loved it and soon I began to believe in that stuff. My grandma also told me stories about ghosts, demons and other creatures and that there are ones who live in the house. At first I was a bit afraid, but my grandma told me that there isn't anything I have to be scared of, but I had to follow some rules. There was a room which belonged to my grandpa. He used it for studies. In this room, in the cellar, I was not allowed to go in. A few weeks passed by and I got used to the beautiful and slightly creepy house, but I always had the feeling that someone was watching me. Soon I began to see things, shadows and little movements. It creeped me out in the beginning, but my grandma told me that I shouldn't be afraid. It's just Thomas. Thomas was a ghost who was haunting the house. She told me that he lived here and passed away many years ago. He's harmless, and if I should see him, I can greet him. That would make him happy. And she was right. Thomas was very harmless. But soon I saw other things, and not all of them were nice and friendly. I remember my first encounter with one of the entities that scared me for the real. It was my first summer with my grandma and aunt. My aunt had a big and friendly dog called Teddy. We played in the backyard of the house. It was a hot day and my aunt said that she would get us something to drink. Teddy followed my aunt everywhere so he went with her inside. I waited outside. Near the house there was a little forest. I remember that I stared a while in the direction of it and then I saw someone who came out of there. 
At first I thought it was a hiker, but the person didn't look like that. It was a very tall man who wore a black coat, a black scarf and a hat. I couldn't see his face and his clothing didn't match up with the hot weather. He must be hot. He came straight up to our yard and stopped right before the fence. He didn't do anything, just stared in my direction. And then he called my name. I know that this sounds unbelievable, but I know what I saw and heard. He waved at me and called my name over and over again. His voice sounded smooth and kind. I don't know why, but I wanted to go closer. And then suddenly, Teddy ran past me and barked at the man. Teddy was a friendly dog. He was happy about every visitor, but this day, he behaved differently. The barkings were aggressive and he growled. It was like he wanted to protect me. My aunt ran out of the house too as she heard Teddy's barking. I remember how I turned around to her. She was confused because it was the first time she'd seen her dog like that. She asked me what happened and I told her that this, this strange man, all in black. But when I turned around, the man was gone. And with gone, I mean he was vanished into thin air. We couldn't see him anymore. Maybe he went back into the forest, but that was impossible because he couldn't be that fast. So we couldn't see him anymore. Teddy stared for a while to the forest and growled silently. My aunt tried to shut him, but for the first time, he didn't listen for a while. She then asked me again who this man was. I told her again what I saw and what I heard. Although she didn't see him, she became afraid. We went inside the house and my aunt checked more than once the backyard through the windows. I was scared too. I didn't know this man, but he knew my name and then his winter clothes. It was a weird and creepy moment, but it doesn't end there. After that, sometimes I could hear the voice of the man. He called me even when I was in the house, and it seems that only I could hear it, no one else. I got nightmares out of nowhere. I woke up with scratches over my arms. There were cold spots in the house, and Teddy behaved weird. He began to look in corners where nothing was. He barked and growled aggressively more often. Notice that there was already something paranormal in the house and Teddy was used to stuff like that. My grandma noticed quickly that something was wrong and she and her daughters had a talk, what they should do about it. My mother wanted to leave but there was no place where we could go. My grandma on the other hand decided to solve the problem in her own way. She prepared rituals and spells and other magical stuff. Well, the problem was solved quickly, but before that, there was a night that I can't forget. It was a Saturday, and we watched TV as suddenly loud noises came from upstairs. It sounded like very heavy steps. Teddy began immediately to growl. We didn't make a move, we just listened. The steps got faster, and then it sounded like someone was running. My mother took me in her arms. She was afraid. I think we all were, although my grandma didn't show fear. The noises stopped for a moment and then we heard them going down the stairs. My grandma immediately stood up and went out of the living room. I heard her saying things. I don't remember what kind of word she said, but it sounded like she threatened someone or in the case, something. And then the smooth voice began to call my name again, but this time we could all hear it. The growling of Teddy became louder and the words of my grandma also got very aggressive. And suddenly, it became quiet. For the following events to give you a better understanding, I have to mention that the door to the cellar isn't far away from the living room. The next few minutes, it was very quiet. My grandma mumbled something and we thought that it was over. But then loud knocking, which came from the cellar door, started. The door was locked and it sounded like someone was trapped in there. And then the knocking was followed by loud, creepy laughter. I can remember it clearly and it scares me and brings tears to my eyes. Till this day, I'm afraid of this voice, of this laughter and banging, but luckily I never heard it again after that night. I also never saw that strange man again. I didn't sleep in this night and had sleeping problems the following ones, but after that my life was normal again. Just my grandma, my aunt and her dog, my mom and a few friendly ghosts and me. Over the years, Occultism and paranormal things became a hobby for me. It runs in the family. 
I was hoping to find out who or what this man was. An evil ghost? A demon? Something else? I really don't know. But to be honest, I don't know if I want to know the truth about this thing. The only thing that I know is that this man was dangerous. He wasn't like Thomas, whose worst habit was to lose things down. If he was in a bad mood. And a few years ago, I saw for the first time the cellar of the house. I was hoping that maybe something was down there that is somehow connected to this entity because it vanished in the cellar. Sadly, it wasn't that exciting. Just old and useless stuff. Nothing paranormal. But I was still scared, I can tell you that. I've experienced a few paranormal things in my short life. Some were creepy, but harmless. Others were terrifying, and one experience haunts me since I was a child. It was the first time I saw something that I would describe as evil. And years later, I saw that evil being again. Just before I start with that, I wanted to say, and I say it in every post, that it's okay if you don't believe me. It's healthy to have doubts, especially with ghost experiences. But please don't be rude, okay? To be honest, for this story, even a part of me doesn't believe it and thinks that I lost my mind. But what happened? Well, a few weeks ago, my girlfriend and I visited my aunt and my grandma. We wanted to see if everything was all right. Because of the virus, times were difficult. My grandma and my aunts live in a beautiful old house near a little village. I spent a large part of my childhood there and because of my family, I came into contact with occult things, magic, ghosts and such stuff. It runs in the family. It was sometimes a weird childhood, but all in all, very beautiful. At first, everything was normal on our visit. We talked about what's going on in our lives, and at one point, I decided to go outside and catch some fresh air. The others stayed inside. Near the house, there's a forest. You have a good look at it if you're in the backyard. I stared at the trees and noticed that something was moving between them. I couldn't see it very well in the beginning, but then it stepped out of the forest and I noticed it was an old friend. The thing, and I really mean thing, looks like a tall man in a black coat, but I know that it isn't a human being. It was just standing there and looking at me. It didn't move. The first time I saw it was many years ago. At this time, I was just a child and this thing scared me almost to death. I always ask myself, what would happen if I saw it again? Now I have the answer. My fear returned. I began to shake and felt like I was losing the ground under my feet. I felt sick and in the end I had to vomit. My girlfriend and my aunt joined me outside and asked me what was wrong. I couldn't answer in the beginning. It all just felt unreal. The man was gone. Later I told them what happened that I saw the tall man from them again. Like me, they were scared. My aunt was there when I saw it for the first time. My grandma banished it from our house back then. My girlfriend knew the story and she knows that I'm like a magnet for paranormal things sometimes. She was often with me when something happened, but she never saw me that scared. My grandma said it would be best if we go immediately. The days after that, my condition was not the best. I couldn't sleep well. I had terrible nightmares. Sometimes so strong and horrible that my girlfriend tried to wake me up. When I woke up, it took a while till I understood that I wasn't in danger, that I was at home in my bed. I was paranoid and couldn't concentrate very well. This went on for days. Even now, it's difficult for me to write this down. I stayed in contact with my aunt after that, but she said this thing didn't return. Honestly, I don't know what I should think about the whole thing. This whole situation is strange and I can't express what I'm feeling. A part of me still believes that it was just my imagination. It feels like I'm going to lose my mind. I have to apologize that this experience isn't well written, but honestly, when I remember that situation, I can't think clearly. All I can say that I have experienced a few paranormal things. Some were really creepy. But the man in the black coat is the scariest thing I've ever seen. I don't know what it wants from me or what it is exactly or why he returned that day and vanished again after that. And again, if you don't believe me, that's okay. <laughs>